Hey guys, in this video I'm going to show you a clip from my interview with Metallica producer Fleming Rasmussen where he discusses Cliff Burton's death, Fleming Rasmussen having produced Rather Lightning, Master of Puppets, and Injustice for All. Later in this video, I'm also going to show you a mini documentary I prepared about Cliff Burton's death. Do you remember recording their tribute to Cliff, To Live Is To Die? Yeah, yeah, To Live Is To Die, yeah. The instrumental. I remember recording that because that was pretty emotional because he wrote most of that. And we did a lot of stuff, you know. We remember Cliff doing that. For you personally, how did you hear the news of Cliff Burton's death and what was your reaction to it, if I may ask? Uh, it was horrible. I was uh, sleeping at my house and my mom called me because she gets up earlier than I do. And she said, one of the guys in Metallica died. I was like, what? And she didn't know which one it was. So I, I had to, you know, make a lot of phone calls and, and, you know, just to find out what the hell is going on. But it was in, in, in all the all news in Denmark had, had the story. So, but the, and this was before the internet. So, you know, you had to listen to radios and, you know, call people. Um, but yeah, it was devastating. I mean, they were on the way to play a gig in Copenhagen. We were going to meet up that afternoon, right? And bus fucking turns over. When Cliff was in the band, it was it was uh, you know, it, it they were you you gotta understand the three albums I did with Metallica was like on the rise. Every album just went one level higher all the time, and it's always easier. When 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 you you know you can see it's getting better and better and better. When once you get to the top and have to stay there, that's when all the problems sets in, which everybody knows if they've seen their movie. Yeah, for sure. So, what was Cliff like in the studio? From what I've heard, he was the most musically gifted. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, it is. Yeah, he and he was the only one that that, that actually been schooled in music. But yeah, I mean. I don't know if he was the better uh, musician. I, I I rate James pretty high up there as uh, one. Of, I think James is probably the best rhythm guitar player in the world. Um, but he was definitely the most schooled music wise, and and some of the parts he came up with were things that that nobody in a metal band would ever have done except for Cliff. So yeah, he was uh, he was great, and he was he was just a mellow kind, you know. Dude, that you know, we hung out. You know, we recorded at night, and and we kind of made it so that we, you know, we started at seven. Actually, on on Master of Puppets, they we started at six at my house, and they and they came and ate. We and my wife made dinner for them, and then we discussed what we needed to do during the night, and we walked to the studio from my house, which was which was like three minutes. And once we'd finished recording, we, it would be four or five, four or five, something like that. And they would always make sure they got to the hotel because they were staying at a hotel on, on Master of Puppets because now they were on a major label, so they, they could afford it. And the morning buffet opened at six, so they always, <laughs> they were there at six so they could eat breakfast buffet and then go to bed and sleep till they got up and got to my house to eat dinner. <laughs> So uh, during that time, you know, once we're done and and they they were gonna like waste an hour, so we were sitting, you know, having a beer, playing poker. He liked playing poker, so yeah, it was he was just a, a cool dude to hang out with. He was uh, really nice, really gentle. Uh, knew a lot of stuff about things, you you know, so you, we could sit and you could sit and talk with him for hours and hours. He was great. He was a crazy bass player actually, because. He he didn't like headphones, so actually, uh, in in for for the basses, the two albums I did with him, um, I actually hooked up a pair of speakers, and stuck his bass amp in another room, and he could like run around and play his bass to the sound on the speakers, so he didn't have to hear headphones. So it's just like playing live, and that's the way we got the best performances. And he did some creative pretty crazy stuff i normally tell people that some of the solos they think are guitar solos that's cliff on his bass because he had all yeah. these pedals he fiddled about but he was he was innovative innovative in, in in a in a way that no other bass players was at that time between ride the lightning and master of puppets did he grow as a musician 
I thought he'd gotten a lot better. I mean, they they got they they went basically on tour for most of the time, and that kind of that really sharpens your chops as as a musician. So they were all. I mean, all of them were way better when they came when we did Master of Puppets. But I mean, so was I because I knew what the band was all about, and we had this we had this vision of Master of Puppets in our heads, and it was all the same vision, and that's why that album is so great because. Everybody wanted to go where we ended, and we all sort of pulled in the same direction, so it was really good. Hey guys, here's the Cliff Burton documentary. John Zazula is the founder of Megaforce Records and the man who signed Metallica to their first ever record deal. Megaforce Records released Kill 'Em All and Ride the Lightning. Metallica eventually switched over to Electro Records, who released the band's third record, Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets was released on March 3rd, 1986. The promotional tour for Master of Puppets was called the Damage Inc. Tour. Damage Inc. being the title of the final track on the original pressings of Master of Puppets. The Damage Inc. Tour began in March of 1986 and took place across the United States and Europe. During one of the European legs of the tour, that's when the tragedy took place. On September 26, 1986, Metallica played what would be their final concert with Cliff Burton. The concert took place in Stockholm, the capital of Sweden. After the show, Metallica began to make their way via bus over to Denmark, where they had a performance planned in Copenhagen for the 27th. Throughout the European leg of the Damage Inc. tour, Metallica had complained that the sleeping cubicles on their tour bus were uncomfortable and not very good. As a way to decide who got to sleep in which bunk, Kirk Hammett and Cliff Burton would draw cards. On the night of September 26, 1986, Cliff Burton won his draw against Kirk Hammett. As the story goes, Cliff Burton looked at Kirk Hammett and said, I want your bunk. Kirk Hammett replied, fine, take my bunk. I'll sleep in the front. It's probably better there anyways. Cliff Burton was asleep shortly before 7 a.m. on September 27th when, according to the bus driver, the bus skid off the road and flipped over. Cliff Burton was thrown through the window of the bus, which fell on top of him. The incident took place southbound on the E4 highway in Sweden near the town of Jungby. I'm going to read you a passage from Mick Wall's Metallica biography, Enter Night, which I think paints a pretty detailed picture of some of the events which transpired. What is known, though, is that traveling south between junctions 82 and 83 of the E4 highway, they were about two miles north of Jungby when it happened. The first James Hetfield knew of it was being wakened by hot coffee pouring over him from the upturned coffee machine. It was the yells and screams that snapped Kirk Hammett out of his sleep. Lars Ulrich's body reacted before his mind did. Sheer adrenaline propelling him through the nearest opening, the pain of a broken toe not even registering until he had stopped running down the road and begun limping back. James jumped free from the rear exit hatch and saw Cliff, his skinny white legs poking out from under the bus. James couldn't take in what he was seeing, the full horror of the scene yet to unfold in his mind. In the crash, Cliff had been thrown against the window, which shattered, leaving him half in, half out of the bus as it collapsed on its side, coming to rest on his head and upper body. James ran over, tried pulling Cliff free. No use. Cliff wasn't moving. That's when it began to sink in. Talking about it in Rolling Stone seven years later, the shock was still palpable. I saw him dead. It was really, really terrible. James recalls the driver saying the bus had hit black ice, then walking for miles in his underwear and socks, searching for black ice. But there was no black ice. At which point I, James, wanted to kill this guy. I was going to end him there. The second bus carrying the rest of the crew arrived on the scene just as the crane arrived to haul the bus back onto its wheels. Mick Hughes, Metallica's audio engineer, watched with horror as the crane put a big chain around the bus and began slowly hoisting it upright again. I don't know if Cliff was dead at this point or not because the bus actually slipped back. They lifted it to pull him out and it slipped back and landed again on the floor. If Cliff hadn't been dead before, he was now. Detective Arn Peterson was reported in a local newspaper to have said the tracks at the accident site were exactly like ones she'd seen when drivers fall asleep at the wheel. However, the driver of the bus stated under oath that he had slept during the day and was fully rested. His testimony was confirmed by the driver of the second Metallica bus, which was carrying the band's crew and equipment. The driver was subsequently determined not to be at fault for the accident, and no charges were brought against him.
Cliff Burton's death was an absolute tragedy and, understandably, affected Metallica emotionally for many years to come. Speaking in 2009, Kirk Hammett had the following to say. When I first joined the band, there was a huge infusion of new energy and, up until Cliff died, we were just so psyched about everything and life in general. But that kind of ended when Cliff left. I still think about him every day. Something he said, something he did, just something. I wasn't too angry in the beginning. I was obviously grieving, but the anger started settling in when I realized that it's not new that people in rock and roll die, but usually it's self-inflicted in terms of excessive drinking or drug abuse. He had nothing to do with it. It's so useless, completely useless. Kirk Hammett was close with Cliff Burden, as was Marsha Zazula. She had the following to say. If I had to say who was I closest to in those days, who did I bond with the most, it was Cliff. He was a treasure to have in my home. He was great. He was respectful. He was warm. He would help me out with Ricky because she was so little and I would be busy doing something. It would be time for her to go to bed, and so he'd read her a story or sing her a song. He was quite the human. James and Lars were just, like, diabolically different. Because at night, James and Dave Mustaine would want to go get drunk, party, and Lars, of course, would be out chasing women. Cliff, though, was really a hippie in a heavy metal band with his bell bottoms and his whole persona, just a beautiful, beautiful human being. He was a musician, pure. He was always respectful. We just sat and reminisced about the old days when they lived in our house and the things that had been done. That was just devastating beyond our wildest dreams that Cliff, of all of them, that warm, settled soul, should be the one who lost his life in that episode. Cliff Burton's death was a very difficult situation for everyone involved with Metallica. However, that didn't stop the band from picking up where they left off and moving forward. Something interesting which happened as a result of Cliff's death was the fact that James and Lars became close friends again. Up until that point, James and Lars had been growing somewhat distant from each other, to the point where there were even rumors that James wanted to get rid of Lars and find a new drummer for Metallica. After Cliff died, however, James and Lars became very close again. That wasn't all. Cliff's death threw all the remaining members' hopes for the future into sharp relief. It didn't just draw Lars and James closer together, it focused their minds like never before on what it was they really wanted out of Metallica. It had always been their band, their songs, but now they really did take control seriously for the first time since the days when there was just the two of them rehearsing in Ron McGovney's garage. Within just over a month's time, Metallica were already back on the road touring. Metallica's final show with Cliff Burton took place in Stockholm, Sweden on September 26, 1986, and their first show with Jason Newstead took place in Los Angeles, California on November 8, 1986. All in all, Cliff Burton's imprint on Metallica is very prominent, and Cliff Burton's memory has never faded from the rock and roll community. I went to a Metallica concert a few years ago, and at one point in time, they had a giant picture of Cliff Burton projected in the background of the stage. So Cliff Burton's presence is literally there at Metallica concerts even today.